Welcome to the lecture on energy conversion. Here we want to first define energy conversion efficiency and then go through the most important examples of energy conversion devices. Also have a quick overview on the historic development of efficiencies. We will then tackle the important issue of the limits to ever increasing efficiency and finally give an outlook on the energy infrastructure that has also a major role to play in the overall energy conversion process from the primary resource to the end use services. Energy conversion efficiency is defined at the process level. Here in the middle of this slide you see a typical black box representation of an energy conversion process, for example a PV module which usually has three energy flows attached. There's an incoming energy Part of that is converted to a useful output here leaving to the right side and you have losses. Here it's heat losses from the module. And then for these three energy flows we can simply define ratios. The most prominent one is of course the efficiency which is defined as useful output divided by total input or he E1 divided by ES and the complement of that would be the loss rate. Complement means if you add those two coefficients, the efficiency and the loss rate, you get a hundred percent because the total energy in this process is conserved. Here we will now continue with the efficiency as a major indicator. So everything we'll look at now for the different examples for energy conversion devices will be measured in terms of their energy conversion efficiency as defined in useful output divided by the total input. And if you now have a look at the first groups of engines that were used to power the industrial revolution, the steam engines, we realize that efficiency has evolved drastically over time. Here a slightly different efficiency indicator is plotted. It is the megajoule of useful work, again work in energy dimension, divided by kilograms of coal supplied. And you see it's a logarithmic scale. So the first atmospheric engines, so where the air pressure does the actual work, were really inefficient and then orders of magnitude better than the later more efficient high temperature, high pressure difference steam engines. But today steam engines are hardly used. They were replaced mostly by steam turbines. One of the reasons is that a steam turbine only has rotating parts, whereas a steam engine also has horizontally moving parts. So there's much more wear and tear that is needed, whereas a steam turbine is just much easier to maintain and can handle higher pressure and temperature ranges. So you can see here that for some cycles, the overall efficiency, meaning the useful work that is extracted from the steam, the heat and the pressure in the steam can be more than 50% for small to medium sized installations. But for the larger uh, installations like nuclear power stations, the efficiency is typically lower, but still around 40%, which is quite a lot for a thermodynamic engine. We also have the internal combustion engine. So the difference to steam engines is that in the internal combustion engine, as it said, the combustion, so the heat generation happens inside the engine, whereas for steam engines, the boiler is outside and the steam is transported to pipes. Also here, we have, have seen a development of efficiencies over time and modern diesel engines can have an efficiency in the range of 45%, meaning that almost half of the energy, the chemical energy, in the fuel, the diesel fuel can be converted into motion, can be brought down to the road. We have other conversion devices, most importantly electric motors, that are much more efficient. So electric motors can have an efficiency of more than 90%, up to 95, 97%. So we have a very high value energy electricity that can be transformed into motion almost with efficiency of 100%. That's of course very interesting for electric vehicles. So the energy in the battery can be brought down to the wheels with almost 100% efficiency, whereas you lose 50% in the internal combustion engine. Another major 
topic for efficiency improvement is of course PV cells, photovoltaic modules. Here we see the evolution of efficiencies over time. So you can see it's an impressive document of human ingenuity, like building, designing devices that can convert sunlight into electricity just by sitting there. And you see, as different technologies emerge, they have new efficiency potentials. So there's records being broken for the different technologies at different stages. And of course, there's still hope for more improvements, even though today's best cells are already above 25%, even at the broad deployment scale. And this is quite impressive. If you think in terms of development across orders of magnitude, maybe the conversion of energy into light is the most impressive one. So we go all the way from candles to highly efficient LEDs, light emitting diodes today. And we see that over time we have come from a state where we can harvest almost none of the energy in the fuel in terms of light. So candles are really inefficient and we move on through the different lighting devices, the light bulbs, the fluorescent bulbs and so on today to highly efficient light emitting diodes. So again, in terms of orders of magnitude, that's probably the most impressive improvement that we have seen over time. Not so impressive is the overall energy conversion efficiency of the economy. So here you see on the left side the different fuel inputs and how they are then in the middle of the graph converted into other forms of energy and finally useful services. And you see the small amount of the services, the energy that we actually use to deliver the service is the upper right section. It's for motion and heat mostly. And everything that's big below, the heat transfer, the combustion losses and all the other losses they are emitted back to the environment without performing any useful energy. So how can it be that overall, despite all this fancy technology development, our energy conversion efficiency is so low? And the main reason is a thermodynamic reason that we'll address in a minute, because most of the processes here are heat-based processes and they have inherent limits to maximum efficiency. Interesting also as a side note that we have a lot of information these days how energy is linked to different services. And this plot here, you can click the link if you want to, really shows a very detailed breakdown of all the different services we enjoy in our society and shows how they are linked ultimately to energy supply. So in modern industrial society, energy is at the bottom of everything. Let us now turn to the second topic of this lecture, which is the limits to energy conversion. One of the major limits is set by the second law of thermodynamics, which dictates that in a thermodynamic system, the total disorder of the system can never decrease. Now, if you think of a situation that's shown here on the left side, there is a heated reservoir, like a boiler, and a cold reservoir, like the river with the cooling water. And there's a heat engine in between, like a steam turbine, for example, which extracts useful work from that steam, like by expanding the steam, for example. Then this heat engine turns chaotic motion, which is just another description for heat, into ordered motion, which is work, like a piston is moving or a generator is turning to produce electricity. Now, the second law of thermodynamics says this is only possible to a certain extent because we cannot fully have a disordered motion turning into an ordered motion because then the total disorder of the system was, would decrease, which is not possible. So this is a very abstract notion of why there are efficiency limits. But fortunately, we have a useful formula at hand for different heat engines that tells us what the maximum limit is according to the laws of thermodynamics. And this limit is given by the equation at the bottom here, the so-called Carnot efficiency, named after a French physicist who first discovered these very basic relationships. 
and it says that if you have the heat exchange at different temperatures so you have the hot reservoir like the steam with a certain temperature and the cold reservoir like the cooling water with a certain temperature you can calculate with this equation what the maximum efficiency is and you see with the steam turbines with about a 50 percent efficiency that this efficiency is related to the temperature difference between the steam and the environment like the cooling tower now what can we do to increase the efficiency further we can increase the temperature difference so a lot of engineering is dedicated to building materials and devices that can withstand higher temperatures there's a similar equation for pressures because pressure difference also gives the possibility to perform work but again with such a conversion efficiency limit so everything that helps you have higher temperatures and higher pressures will bring up efficiency but then there's this other physical limit that the materials we construct can't stand any temperature and pressure so there's also limits to what the materials we have can actually withstand and this gives then the actual practical limit to the Carnot efficiency which as we saw earlier today is a bit above 50 percent for the most efficient devices and more around 40 to 45 percent for the typical efficient internal combustion engines and large power stations another influencing factor on efficiency and also price development is the so-called technology learning as the industry produces more and more of the same thing they tend to get very efficient at it because simply you have a lot of experience on how things are done you can scale up production you have less failures in between so everything is running very smoothly and here you see the development of photovoltaic costs plotted over the cumulative production so the total amount of things that were produced and you see as we produce more and more stuff gets cheaper because we simply become very good at doing it without much mistakes and very efficiently so the question is now how will this trend continue in the future will we be able to bring down costs ever more and bring up efficiency ever more or are there limits we don't fully know it yet for the technologies that are still development developing but we can see how things worked in history for other technologies and here is an example from steel making steel making is a very energy intensive process so on the left side you see that over time the efficiency for making one ton of steel decreased but saturated at certain levels recently there was always a strong incentive to de decrease energy consumption because energy is a major cost factor for materials production so the incentive has always been there even without the climate crisis or any other energy issue it was always a cost factor but we see empirically as technologies are mature the energy savings potential at some point will be utilized will be seized and then energy consumption stays at a certain bottom level on the right side you see a similar plot for cement we also had strong improvements as technology matured and costs were decreased but now we have a rather stable technology that will not change anymore and we can assume that the same also will happen to for example pv technology at some point that the technology will be mature will be highly efficient but there's very little left to gain another question regarding efficiency increases is of course the possible scale up we know that large wind turbines are more efficient in general because they can harvest more wind and also go to altitudes with a very stable wind speed but at some point again the costs will explode because we have these huge installations with very large material requirements so we can assume that there is a limit to which we can scale wind turbines simply because at some point our materials will fail us or these turbines will be so large that it's too costly to construct them and so on 
the uh, overall topic of to what extent can we scale up devices is very interesting, very complex. There are no simple answers to it. Engineering has shown that there are very beautiful, elegant and also cheap solutions. But technology development has also shown that many processes mature over time and at some point we will reach a limit, technology will be mature and then we have to find other solutions. Another central aspect of energy conversion is the infrastructure we need to transport and to store all the energy carriers. Every year we extract billions of tons of fossil energies at different places of the planet and we ship them across the planet and transport them. All this infrastructure itself requires a lot of energy to operate, it requires a lot of materials to be built and it has a lot of land use and other environmental impacts. Here you see for example a map of the US pipeline network both for oil and for gas and you can see where the industrial centers are and where the production centers are. All this infrastructure needs materials, needs energy to operate, needs maintenance. So it's a major cost factor, emissions factor, potentially also geopolitical factor. For example, if a pipeline is to be built through a political, very sensitive area. Globally, we have built up an impressive stock of power stations of different technologies, different ages, different energy carriers, we know a lot about supplying ourselves with the energy that we need and also adjusting our technologies to the circumstances. For example, when there's hydropower potential or when there's a lack of cooling water, we can choose technologies that work in many, many different circumstances. But as we have new challenges globally, especially the climate challenge, we need to rethink our past energy decisions and continue the transformation towards a more sustainable energy supply. And here in this power plant map from Germany, you can see actually that this transition is already ongoing. You can see that there's a lot of coal-fired power plants and also nuclear power plants, but a lot of wind and solar is coming up. So there's actually quite a diverse mix in this country right now in terms of energy and electricity generation infrastructure and this mix is actually rapidly changing. The power stations or electricity generating station are only part of the picture. To get the electricity to where it's needed to the consumers and households, businesses and industry, you need the transmission grid. Typically a grid has different voltage levels this is because we have different transport distances that are suitable for different voltage levels. The higher the voltage level, the more expensive it is to transform to such a voltage level, but the higher is also the distance you can cover. So we have high voltage line to cover basic distances that span the entire countries, and we have medium to low voltage line that goes in the, the last kilometers from the substation to the households or other small consumers. And the actual map of the national electricity grid is shown here on the left side. You can actually see it spans the entire country and connects both the generating sites with the consumer sites, especially in the southwest where large parts of the population live. Next to the electricity grid, many countries also have a pipeline grid for oil products, for natural gas, and also sometimes for specialty chemicals like ethylene that are sent between chemical plants. The infrastructure networks, as you see them here, are not static objects. They change over time. They need to be transformed to continue to fulfill the different tasks that are given to them. One example is that as we have more renewable energy in the system, we also need to expand the grid mainly for two reasons. The first reason is that the places where we can harvest the renewable energies are not necessarily the places where the consumers sit or live. So we need to bridge the distance between them. And the second reason is that many renewable energy forms are intermittent, so they're only available at certain times, often with random variations. So we need a certain area to 
average out the fluctuation or we need the connections to neighboring countries to link to their fluctuating system to also get some balancing potential there. So these are two reasons why we need to expand the grid in most situations once we have a transition to renewable energy. Finally, an example of an even more extreme energy infrastructure project, the so-called Desert Tech project. The idea is to use the area available in arid and desert regions in Northern Africa and West Asia, and also the wind power potential of the coastal regions, to build a large transcontinental electricity grid to supply especially the European consumers and industry with renewable electricity. With the idea of a mutual benefit, especially revenue, of course, for the countries that generate all the electricity on their land. You know that this project has not really worked out in practice. It's too ambitious. It would require a lot of infrastructure. It would also put the consuming countries into a dependency relationship of the supplying countries, the generating countries, and many of the countries are at the moment politically unstable. So this project has not materialized, even though it's a powerful vision, but small parts of it have become reality. For example, now in Morocco, we have a lot of solar electricity being generated and mostly supplying domestic demand. The question at which scale we should integrate grids remains an open one. There's many different movements, all from being locally self-sufficient in terms of energy supply, which is possible, but also very expensive, to such huge transcontinental projects, but that also carry their own risks and costs that need to be factored into the decision making. So a lot of research, a lot of knowledge needs to be gained on finding the right scale of the infrastructure for the energy transition. And with that comment, I would like to close this lecture. Thank you.